All right. Let's open up our Bibles to James. We're going to look at the general epistles. <clears throat> Let me give you a, a quick rundown of the New Testament. You have the four books that start the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are called what? Gospels. Gospels. Everything else are letters from Acts to Revelation. They're all letters written to the churches throughout uh, the territory that Paul had reached, Peter, and so forth. So they're letter, letters, or you might hear the word epistles, which means the same thing, letters. They're epistles. So gospels, epistles. And so Roman touched on Paul's epistles, Paul's letters, uh, to the various places that he ministered to and then came back and, and wrote to them because of some of the struggles that they were going through. And now we're going to look at what they call the general epistles in that they're not Paul's, they're James, they're Peter's, there's John's, there's Jude, um, and so forth. <clears throat> I don't think I'm missing any of them. Um, I'm sorry, someone said something? No? Okay, I thought I missed one. Um, and then John in Revelation, of course. So we're going to touch on those epistles here. Uh, we'll go through them. But I want to just make a point before we get started. See, we need to understand the whole purpose of this book being written a book that is challenged though it's been around for you know <laughs> thousands of years we have manuscripts that uh, are numerous uh, compared to other manuscripts of let's say uh, the existence of plato or uh, aristotle's or or even caesar i mean the documents on the bible itself are like this compared to this uh, any other historical figure when you when you really do the research uh, it's just out, outlandish and, and so it's a book that has challenged so much and the challenge of it is is what is it saying to us what is the purpose of it uh, why did God leave this book behind so that we could read and and know about him and, and it is to know him in fact someone put it this way it's history so when you think of history right and we all hate history right we hate history in school hated history <clears throat> but when you take his story it is his story it is jesus's story and you can go all the way back to the book of genesis when it says that god walked with adam and eve that was jesus <clears throat> and then moses went to the mount sinai and the burning bush said uh, i am that's who you tell them sent you i am that i am and then you go to the new testament and you hear in john chapter 8 and jesus tells the religious leaders look before before abraham was born i am jesus said so he was basically saying i was that burning bush and so the old testament is pointing to jesus the new testament is pointing back at jesus so it's really his story now, okay, so we get that. It's, it's about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and fulfilling everything and so forth. But what is the, the main purpose and theme? And depending on your perspective, depending on your goals, depending on what you want to believe, you'll make it what you want it to be. And that's where we run into trouble. When we make it into something that it's not. And that's why our relationships are struggling. That's why our relationship with God is struggling. That's why we're not prospering. That's why we're always battling is because we haven't taken the word for what it says. We have basically convinced ourselves that we know what it says and it's on my side. It's for me. And that is so far from true. And that is so far from being a child of God because a child of God is going to want to know what God is saying because they love God question is do you love God do you really love him and do you really want to know what he has to say because he is your father and he loves you beyond measure and he wants to reveal to you the truth so that you do have a prosperous life so so what is the bible telling us what is the whole theme of the scriptures what is it talking about well let me give you C.S. Lewis's rendition of what he thought he says now we begin to see what it is that the new testament is always talking about it talks about Christians being born again. Now, I'm going to stop there just for a second. I'll read on in a minute. So one of the themes of the, uh, of the New Testament is, is that Christians should be born again. And you can go back to the Gospel of John and see what it means to be born again. 
And of course, some of you might be saying, because you're young believers and you haven't read the scriptures, and I encourage you to read those in John chapter three, you might be saying, how can we be born again? And that's exactly what the religious leader uh, Nicodemus said, what are you talking about? And of course, Jesus was talking about spiritually, that there has to be a rebirth in you. <clears throat> Before you were a Christian, you walked a certain path, lived a certain life. When you accepted Christ and surrendered your life to him, now you walk a different path and a different life. It should be different. If it hasn't changed drastically, something's wrong. There's something that you didn't get, something that you're not surrendering. And you really have to deal with that, first of all, before you can even move on. Because you're living your life in a religious system. You've created this God that says, I'm okay, and my ways are right, and I don't need to be born again. I don't need to change. I don't need to grow. I don't need to, you know, love this person or that person and do this or do that. You know, no, you got it wrong. You created your own God. No, you have to do those things because you are born again. And not only do you have to, you desire to because you know they're pleasing to the Lord. So you must be born again. You must change your course of life. You must now desire to be a new creature, as Paul said in Corinthians. And the old things pass away. What does that mean, old things pass away? It means your old life is done. It's dead. So now live a new life, a, a joyful life, a life serving God, a life enjoying his presence at all times, a life blessed with your family, with your spouse, with your children, with, with the church, the body of Christ, and so forth. Just live a blessed life. Last week, we, we kind of gave everyone an opportunity to give thanks. And it was just so neat to hear the testimonies of a family here in the church and that's what it's about family and, and that's the aspect of here i was walking this way before christ where i had my blood family and they were everything f to me and they still are everything to me but all of a sudden i'm walking another direction and i've got this whole new family that's a spiritual family that's even better than my blood family because we're like-minded, we have purpose, we're growing in the same direction, we're hoping for the same thing, we're eternally secure in Christ and, and, and entering into heaven. And it's just a whole different dynamic and it's so much um, better than this family sometimes that, that has a mixture of whether they know God or not and it can be a struggle. And you hope to see them come to be born again. So C.S. Lewis says one of the main themes of the scriptures is to be born again. Because God came to save you from your sins. And you go back all the way to Genesis. And man blew it when they sinned. So God now created a plan to restore man. Because he loves us that much. So one of the themes is be born again. It talks about them putting on Christ. Okay, So that's part of being born again. You want to be like Christ. Uh, Tim Tebow gets so much slack, you know, because he's a football player, and before the games, he gets on his knees, and he prays. Oh, <laughs> oh, there he goes, there he goes, there's he praying, you know, while everyone else is doing whatever they want to do. So much slack. He, he gets involved in this relationship, and this girl wants to have sex with him, and he says, oh, no, I don't do that. I'm saving myself for my wife, and so she dumps him, and he gets all this slack. I'll tell you, that's putting on Christ. That's putting on Christ. Living out his faith in Jesus Christ. Being formed, uh, and also it's about Christ being formed in us. Boy, that's so important. Allowing Christ being formed in us. We should live like Christ. You know, there's something about that that I think you need to understand. That means you have to remove yourself and let Christ live in you. That means your feelings and your emotions, and I know it's difficult, I'm not saying it's easy. Your feelings and emotions, you have to throw them to the side and say, I'm still gonna live like, I'm gonna let Christ live through me. And so if there's an enemy, and you know, you're like, oh, oh. so you gotta let Christ live in you and, and let him love them the way that he loves them. So letting him live in you, forming himself in you. About our, then also about our coming to have the mind of Christ. So you get his idea, born again, putting on Christ, being formed in us, and then even the mind of Christ. How do you get the mind of Christ? Reading the word of God, by reading the word of God. In its context, don't pull it out, 
Don't pull it out of context. It's funny, we've been going through Ephesians in our devotions, and poor ladies that were there, <clears throat> they went through uh, Ephesians 5 twice because I forgot where I was at. And so we went over the, the scriptures, wives submit unto your husbands, twice. Whew. If I wasn't in trouble the first time, <laughs> the second time I was really in trouble. Then I realized that um, there was only Mariana that was still married, so, so I was fine. <clears throat> because she gets it <clears throat> you know but just looking at that scripture in its context the truth of the matter is is wives you're just going to submit to your husbands they're the head and, and i and you can go whoa, 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 wait 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 the, the scripture before that says submit to one another yes it does and, and in the context of the, the community of christianity yeah we're to submit to one another and if you were to come to me and say pastor you know you, uh, there's an area that i see and you need to maybe pray about correcting that and i'm supposed to say oh okay I'll, I'll take a look at it and i'm gonna see if i need to correct that i'm submitting to that truth in the context of god in the context and in the unity of god the father and the holy spirit jesus submits to the father different context in the context of a corporate america a ceo you submit to the ceo you're the general manager you get fired if you don't listen and obey in subordination in the context of the family the wives are to submit to the husband and yes, we submit to one another. It's scriptural in its context. But our society, and we were discussing this, <clears throat> um, unfortunately has changed the mind, not to Christ, but to the culture. To the culture. And we need to get it back to Christ because it's biblical truth. And as believers, we should desire that. Ladies, I'm not, I'm not getting down on you, but what a great opportunity for you married ladies to be an example for the rest of the world and to the other ladies and to change the trend of what's going on that when someone comes to you and says oh my husband oh, oh, oh you are to respect them you are to submit to them oh don't don't do that don't tear him apart but love him and respect him that would change that would change our culture it would change our families it would change everything uh, we need to have the mind of Christ. Put right out of your head the idea that there are only fancy ways of saying that Christians are to read what Christ said and try to carry it out as a man may read what Plato or Marx said and try to carry it out. So uh, get that out of your head. It, it's beyond that than just reading a book and trying to get something positive. He goes on. They mean something much more than that. They mean that a real person, Christ, here and now, in that very room where you are saying your prayers is doing things for you. It is not a question of a good man who died 2,000 years ago. It is a living man, still as much a man as you, and still as much God as he was when he created the world. Really coming and inferring with your very self, killing the old nature self in you and replacing it with the kind of self he has at first only for moments then for long periods of time finally if all goes well turning you permanently into a different sort of thing into a new little christ a being which in its own small way has the same kind of life as god which shares in his power joy knowledge and eternity don't be deceived you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of god what he is saying there is is that there are steps to your changed life and at first it's gradual and you start learning things it's neat because there was a sister here this morning with us in devotional and she hasn't been with us maybe six months or so new to the faith and I started sharing some of these things, and she start, she's agreeing. She goes, I would never agree before, but now I agree now. And you can see that heart that has been born again and now receiving the truth in her life. You know, that's what born again means. The person that fights it and fights biblical truth, be careful. Something's wrong. Something's wrong there. And you need to understand that and humble yourselves before the Lord. So let's go to James now, the book of James. <clears throat> So James here is the author, um, according to the salutation here, the introduction here in verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Uh, James is the brother of Jesus. The only two references to him in the gospel mentioned him as his brother in Matthew chapter 13, uh, Mark chapter 6. So this writer of the book of James is the brother of Jesus Christ. We know that in the beginning he had problems believing that Jesus was the Messiah. But then after the resurrection, after seeing him buried, dead, and then resurrecting to a new life, James became a believer, born again. And so he is the author of this book. Uh, the date of this book uh, varies depending on who you're reading, but basically, traditionally, most believe it to be written somewhere around uh, 46 to 49 AD, one, probably one of the most uh, more recent books that were written immediately after uh, the death of Jesus Christ and so forth. Um, and he's writing to, and he's very clear in saying this uh, to us here, to the 12 tribes there in verse 1, which are scattered abroad. And then he says, my brother encountered all joy when you fall into various trials. And so he immediately is talking about the trials, the hardships, the struggles that the Christians were having at that time. Now, this 12 tribes is including all of Jews that are believers. And so when he says 12, it's the full number 12. So all Jews is what he's saying there. He's not just isolating them in individual tribes and so forth. He's just saying uh, the whole tribes of Israel, this is for you. And I know that you're going through difficult times and struggles, uh, but I want you to know that God loves you and he wants to encourage you, continue with the faith, continue to serve him in this time. Now, the theme of this book and probably the theme that you get most out of it and you hear all the time is what? Faith, right? It's a book of faith. It's really a practical book on, <clears throat> on works, works that have faith. Faith is an interesting thing because we so misunderstand what faith means uh, a lot of people will go and read the new testament even paul's description of faith like in ephesians 2 8 you know that it is through great it is through faith by grace that you have been saved and it's not of yourselves at least you can boast so there's nothing you can do for salvation it is a gift of god and you receive it and so we think oh wow so i don't have to change i don't have to be born again i can just live my life i'm saved that's not what it's saying that's not what it's saying. Because if you keep reading in the context, you'll see him says, but there's been works prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. And so uh, those works are the evidence of your faith. And so James kind of clarifies what Paul was saying there in his writings when he talks about faith versus works. And faith plays an important role in the theology of James, a very important role. Uh, you cannot say you have faith and do nothing. because that's not faith. Paul, James even challenged them by saying, look, if you want to say you have faith, show me your faith. He says, I'll show you my faith by my works. And so the works are evidence of your faith. Now you don't work to show that you have faith. Your works are evidence of your faith. It's the fruit of your faith. That's hard to understand. I can say that I am a orange tree all I want, and I might even have a little label on there and it says orange navel. But if I never produce orange, oranges, navels, maybe I produce lemons or limes. After a while, you're going to go, you're not an orange tree. <laughs> you know, you're a lime tree. You're sour. You know, but if I am a navel tree, then the natural thing is for me to produce navel oranges. That's the natural thing. And so it's because you have faith that you have works. There are some similarities that exist between the concepts of faith in James and even in the teachings of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ talked about oftentimes works. And so they work together. Very important that your faith has works. But it's also important to realize that it is not your works that save you. It is your faith that saves you, but it is your works that proves you have faith. And so we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. But then I go and now work. And there's so many people, you know this, especially as you get into bigger churches and even in these small churches, you get people that just come in, sit down and go home. 
You know, and you have to wonder. Now, I don't know. Maybe they're involved in ministries, and I know there's been times where I realize afterwards when, they, when I confront them and talk to them more, they say, oh, yeah, I'm actually in a ministry over here. So I totally get that. But generally speaking, there are people that just come in and sit and hear the word and then go, and they don't even pick it up during the week. And that's religion. That is religion. That's not faith that works. Faith that works is things like our Thanksgiving luncheon. That was a work of faith that we did because we want to make God's love known to this community. So the purpose of this letter that James writes here is really to strengthen uh, the Jewish Christians while they're going through trials, uh, to correct a misunderstanding of Paul's doctrine of justification by faith. That, it, it, that yes, faith justifies you, but it's also um, proved that you have faith by the works you have. And also to pass down to the first generation Christians a wealth of practical wisdoms here. It is James that talks about um, our selfishness, you know, another scripture that we use quite often in the book of James uh, when we have arguments and fights in James chapter 4 where he says where do wars and fights come from among you good question why do we fight why do we get in arguments why are nations fighting against each other Uh, why did uh, these three people uh, go into the regional center there in San Bernardino and just start shooting 30 seconds that's all it took 30 seconds they were totally geared up opened up the doors in 30 seconds of rifle shooting, 15 seconds, stopped, reloaded, 15 more. Closed the doors, and they were gone. By the time police got there, they weren't even around. But through tips and so forth, they were able to find them. Why is that? James says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? Isn't that really where they come from? Because you have a philosophy You have a religious faith or a belief system that is cruel and wicked. I was listening to a Muslim girl, and she was describing describing Islam. And she was saying, don't tell me your definition of it. She's really passionate about it. In fact, she was really upfront. She goes, I get mad, so forgive me if all of a sudden I, I start getting a little upset. She goes, I was raised in Islam. Islam is not a race. It is a faith is is a religion and people belong to it and their purpose is to be like muhammad and then she said if you're a christian who are you supposed to be like pastor reuben no please by all means don't even you're to be like jesus well let's look at jesus he cared for people he, he didn't curse people didn't harm people in fact he was like a sheep to the slaughter that's our jesus So she says, let me tell you who Muhammad is. He's a murderer. He's a rapist. He went into a town, killed all the men, took all the women, raped them all. Took their children, raped them too. He's a molester, child molester. So she says, this is what I was taught as a Muslim child. And it is our goal to be like him. And so for a true Islamic Muslim to be faithful to his religion, he will go out and do these terrorist acts with joy because he's being like Muhammad. And that's why they do it without callous because they think they're being like their leader. And that makes total sense. It makes total sense on why they're doing it. And this is coming from a Muslim. I saw another video of a, of a Muslim woman, an Arab woman, Islamic woman. She goes to Israel because her child is sick. She goes to Israel, to their hospital, and says, please save my child. Of course, Israel saves the child. And someone's interviewing her, talking to her, and asking her why she's here. She goes, well, I know that Israel will help us. I know they'll they'll take care of my child. And then he starts asking about Jerusalem. She goes, oh, I want to go to Jerusalem one day. I've never been to Jerusalem, but that's, that's where the holy prophet Muhammad was at, and so forth. She says, no, 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 that's not where the prophet was at. That's where the temple of the Jews were at. Oh, no, 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 that's a lie. There was no temple there. He says, can't we coexist together? At least you guys get one side. No, 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 we can't coexist. In fact, it'll be my joy for my son to get better and do jihad. So she, she took him to Israel to get better so that he'd become a terrorist and kill Jews. And she's like, I know you're getting mad at me, but don't get mad because this is what our prophet would want us to do. And we do it with joy. I'm not angry. We do it 
joyfully. We give our kids joyfully. I have had several of my kids already die and family members die. I'm not weeping over them. It's a, it, it is a joy to do it. I'm thinking, wow, that's their mindset. Where do rumors and wars and fights come from among us? Because we have our own desires and pleasures. Why do we fight in our marriages? Because we want our own ways. We desire our own things. We want things to be done this way and not that way. Again, same, same principle, same thing happening there. Um, what we need to do is humble ourselves and be more like Christ. Be more like Christ. Let's look at the book of Peter. <clears throat> I love Peter. I am so much like him at, at times. And maybe even Paul too. But First Peter, Second Peter, author is obviously Peter. Turn to the next book over. And we see there in verse 1, Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatea, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a mouthful. Basically, what he's saying is, look, uh, you are here because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the work that he has done. You're sanctified, you're elected, you're foreknown. God has called you uh, to, to be his child. So he's writing basically to the Jewish Gentile believers there who were scattered because of the persecution that was taking place in Jerusalem. Uh, the date or the period was, uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, when. Some suggest uh, 63 to 64 AD, uh, somewhere um, there in Babylon, Peter may have been. The purpose is to bring us into a spiritual maturity. Uh, he, he definitely talks about us. Um, look at chapter two. Therefore laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. Boy, there's some, some good works of faith there. You shouldn't be speaking evil of anybody or envying anyone. In fact, what you should be doing, verse 2, as newborn ba babies desiring the pure milk of the word. That's what we should be doing. Give me the word. I want to know the word. What does God have to say? I want to live like that. I want to change the world. I want to be better than Mother Teresa, you know, and I want to be effective in this world here. So he writes to encourage them to maturity. So desire the, the word of God may you, where you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So obviously if you're born again, if you're born again, then obviously you're going to desire the, the word of God. And that's why you're all here. And so he's strengthening, blessing them and hope, giving them hope in Jesus Christ. Um, beautiful word again he deals with uh, various topics of submission too just as Paul did in Ephesians look at verse 18 servants be submissive to your masters very important in the unity of the workplace and slavery this is this is the proper thing to do as believers you're an employee and we would have no problem with that right whatsoever you go to work and you are told to do a job you're to do it you totally get that you might slack off a little bit when no one's looking. You know, I get that. That happens all the time. But you expect a paycheck at the end of the month. Well, you are what? Submitting yourself to your employer. That's all you're doing there. So he talks about that within that context. Look at verse 13. Back up a little bit. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme. So he's talking there about submission also, but to government. So a police officer says, pull over. You know, I don't have to submit to you. Forget you. You know, they're going to run you down, throw you on the ground, you know, and give you a whipping if that's what you need. Submission, though. You say, yes, sir. Hands on, on, I mean, I immediately put my hands up on the steering wheel. He comes up. Let me see your license. Okay, I'm reaching for my license. You know, and you pull out your license. You give it to him. And he goes, okay, wait right here. He comes back. Oh, wow, you got a great record here. Go on. That's happened to me. But we don't argue that because it's submission. Then look at chapter 3. Likewise, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Oh, no, you've got to be kidding me. You know? Oh, boy, we struggle with that. Verse 7. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. 
that your prayers may not be hindered. Why Husbands understand they're weaker. Now, I don't know if wives, if you understand that you're the weaker vessel. Well, I'm not weak. Don't you know women's lib? We have equal rights. You know, no, the Bible says you're weak. If you have a problem with that, then you have a problem with God. Because I didn't say that. God just said it, right? Right there. Look at it again. As to the, what? Don't, uh, ladies, read that, ladies. Weaker. Can you say weaker? Uh, uh, weaker. <laughs> You're weaker vessels. Just how God created you. There's nothing wrong with that. The culture says, no, you're just like a man. And so what do we do? We, we force it on everybody. So now you watch all the commercials, you watch all the sitcoms, you watch all the movies, and who's the dumb person in it? The man. And the woman's the smart one, you know, of course. And we've got it backwards. We've got it backwards. They're both smart. So <clears throat> he talks on marriage there, uh, submission quite often, and so forth. And then he um, also talks about the sufferings of Christ as an example. Look at verse 18 of chapter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. The work of Christ on the cross for us. Then we come to Second Peter, also author and writer, writing to those who had received like precious faith. In other words, like-minded people. Boy. Ephesians talks about that, the unity of the body of Christ. Do you know that we're all on a path of unity? You know that? We're all on a path to unity. And when we die, guess what? We'll all be in <laughs> unity because when we get there, God will reveal everything. But we're all on a path of unity as believers. And as you're reading the word of God and as you're studying it, uh, God is going to reveal things to you that will challenge you to change. As I teach it, you're challenged all the time whether to agree or not agree. And if it's in the word of God and it's saying it here, you have to know I'm not the one saying it. It's saying it right here in the scriptures and so you're challenged to believe God or not believe God and what he says. And if you believe God, then we become in unity with one another. You know, I, I believe going to church is important. Why do I believe that? Because I read it in the scriptures. Everything that I read in scriptures that talks about fellowship, like in the Old Testament and the tribes gathering together within their tribes of fellowship and then all of them surrounding the tabernacle where Christ or God dwelt in worship, that's church taking place right there with the whole tribes of Israel. And then you build a temple or a church and you come to offer your offerings and to worship in psalms and to give your thanksgivings and to offer up your sacrifice that's church and i read those things i come to the new testament in hebrews and it talks about not forsaking the assemblings of one another that's church and yet people think i don't have to go to church and you're right you don't have to go to church to be saved you don't have to stop cussing to be saved you don't have to stop drinking to be saved uh, you don't have to stop sleeping with your significant other to be saved. You have to receive Christ into your heart, surrender your life to him. That's how you're saved. But now that you're saved, you go, I shouldn't be sleeping with my significant other. I need to get married because that's what scripture says. I shouldn't be cussing because the Bible talks about coarse gesturing. I shouldn't be bickering. I shouldn't be name calling because that's what Peter just said. So those things start to change because you're born again. The place in writing here was in Rome about six years after uh, he wrote uh, First Peter. So he moved quite a distance. Again, the purpose of Peter so that after Peter's <clears throat> death, they would remember his teachings every time they read the letter. And he tells us that in, in Second Peter um, just as a reminder uh, to them to read. And so Peter was very adamant about the importance of reading the scripture. If you go and look at verse 20 of chapter one, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture, that is no scripture at all, is, a, is of any private interpretation. What does the world say? Oh, it's a book written by a bunch of guys. That's private interpretation. Well, the Bible says no scripture is of any private interpretation. 
but prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So he explains it to us how the scriptures were written. They were written by God as he moved in the lives of these men, giving them the prophetic word. These guys didn't get together. There's, uh, what, over 66 different authors or 66 books with a dozen different authors 40 something authors you know that had wrote this from various times from the new testament moses all the way to the apostle john throughout history and yet they have a book that just flows so smoothly with itself that is uh not a bunch of guys getting together writing a book that is definitely the lord working and we come to the book of john i love the book of john one of my favorite books. McGee swears by this book that if you start a new church and read this book, your church will grow. I wish that were true for us because <laughs> I tried reading it twice and it didn't grow as I expected it to. But it's still a good book. The author is John the Apostle, the one who laid his head on Jesus' chest there at the uh, supper of table there as they partook of Passover together. He's also the author of uh, the Gospel of John and also the book of Revelation. He's writing to all believers that are out there. There was a, a group of people called Gnostics and they had Gnosticism that believed that Jesus uh, didn't come in a bodily form, that Jesus really didn't have to um, keep any laws and so forth because he was spiritual and so in the body you could sin all you wanted to sin i mean we still have narcissism today with christians i can sleep with whoever i want it doesn't matter well you're wrong it does matter to christ you're 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 desecrating the temple of god because god dwells in you and now you're sleeping with someone that you're not supposed to be sleeping with and that you're just you're doing what the children of israel did bringing idols into the temple and you're sleeping with someone the opposite sex and you're having a relationship intimacy with this person it's like bringing idols into the temple because god's dwelling there within you he wants a holy matrimony and if the person is not willing to to marry you get rid of them move on and pray that god finds you someone to get married and wait for that right person and god will bless you if you do the right thing so he's written writing to all believers now he is the the later of the writers uh, the oldest of the apostles, probably the last one to, to die or mar be martyred, just depending on who you believe, as far as uh, traditions. And I mention traditions just as a mention. We don't consider it uh, dogmatic because we don't have the evidence and it's not in the scriptures here in the Bible exactly what happened to him, so we really can't say. But it was written about 90 A.D. And the theme of this little epistle here is God is light, God is love, and God is life. Uh, pretty much he's all. God is everything. He is our light uh, for our life, right? He is our truth, in other words. He illuminates darkness. He reveals what's in our hearts, and we're to walk in the light as he is in the light. And then God is our love. He's our example of love. He loved us, and so we should also love, and he's our very life. Without him, we have not life purpose is that your joy may be made full and that you sin not to bring you to a life of victory to give you power over sin we saw that on sunday when we talked about romans and sin and how we shouldn't be sinning because sin always leads to uh, like james said wars right that's why you your members are always fighting because there's sin involved and we shouldn't be sinning <clears throat> I love the scripture here in chapter two. This, this, just this picture of Jesus and what he's done for us. Uh, John says, my little children, and, he, and he's known for that, my little children, because he just loved God's people so much. And so he was like a grandpa, like Pastor Chuck. You know, they call Pastor Chuck Papa Chuck. A lot of people call him Papa Chuck. Uh, you know, 80-something-year-old guy, and you have all these kids, and like, Papa Chuck, Papa Chuck. He's an old guy, and he loved them to death. He says, my little children, these things are right to you that you may not sin. So that's his, his purpose, is, is that you, you be holy, that you be sinless uh, and happy. Uh, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's our advocate. He's advocating our case. He's not against us. He's not an accuser. You know what an accuser is, right? 
someone who accuses you of things. That's Satan. Uh, we shouldn't be accusers. We should be more advocates. An advocate defends. So uh, in our relationships, we should defend one another. We should defend each other in the body of Christ. Uh, we should defend each other when it comes to situations. We should never accuse. There's only one accuser, and that's Satan. But we have an advocate, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, I love this because think about this for a second. Because when you accuse, you know who you're fighting against? You know who your advocate is? Jesus Christ. You become the accuser, Jesus is the advocate. And so you're fighting him. Even though you're accusing someone that you might love or say you love or someone that you know, but in reality, Jesus is advocating for them. Here's the picture, guys. God sees us already complete, right? He already sees us complete. You don't see me complete. You see all my flaws. My wife sees more of my flaws than anyone else. But Jesus sees me complete. And so when you accuse me, he says, of what? He's already complete. He's already in the heavenly places. It, my blood's already covered that. So what he's saying is, you need to learn to live with it. Let me work in him and he'll grow. Because I see him already there. Even though he's not there, but as he's there. And so you begin to fight against the advocate Jesus himself. So I love that scripture. And then it goes on and says, he himself is a propitiation for our sins. And not ours only, but also for the whole world. Wow. A propitiation is a sin offering. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, some idolatry, and he takes this from some of the heathen idolatrous uh, and how they offered up sacrifices to their gods. So, so, you know, the volcano's angry. So you find a nice, beautiful virgin and you throw her in the volcano and it's happy. That means propitiation. That's what it's saying. So God is angry at mankind because of sin. Jesus is the propitiation that calms God's anger because his blood was shed. That's the picture there. He was our propitiation. He was the one that was sacrificed. He went to the cross. That, that's deep, guys, when you think about it. And you start accusing other people um, when Jesus was your propitiation your, for yourself and your own sins. Because you may see several sins in someone, and you have several of your own that you're dealing with. Be careful, because in the measure that you judge, You'll be judged also. So a good book, uh, a book of encouragement. Go to chapter three. Um, is it chapter three or is it chapter five? Yeah, chapter five, verse 13. Uh, John says, I write these things to you, that you, the, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So there's a security there, right? I'm writing to you that believe in Jesus Christ. I want you to know you have eternal life. You've been born again, so be assured. You know, when you start struggling with sin and you go, man, I keep sinning, man, I'm I, I messing up, man, that's good. That shows you're born again because God's working in your life. But if you're the type that says, oh, look at that, oh, look at that, oh, you're no good, oh, blah, blah, blah. whoa, 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 uh, maybe something's wrong there because you're not seeing yourself, but you see everyone else. Um, you're not born again. You're not born again. So be careful. <clears throat> the son of God that you may know you have eternal life encouraging words there and then we come to two little epistles that that are just so small we forget about them you mean there's a second John and third John yeah in fact I always thought that Jude and Obadiah in the Old Testament were the smallest books but they aren't I think it's third John or second John second John or, or second John has 13 verses and third John has 14 verses compared to Jude who, Jude who has 20 20 something uh what 26 verses or so 25 verses so I, I never saw that until the well-rooted ministry and we were going through third john so same author the the apostle john second john uh was written when he's in his 90s so older guy very mature he's writing to a lady and to her children he calls them an elect that is that they're they're children of god and the theme of this whole little letter here is about truth uh, he mentions that one two three four five times six times there uh, in third john i'm sorry it was in third john and second john yeah he 
He also uh, purposed to deal with those false prophets and their false testimonies against, uh, against Jesus Christ there in verse 7. Uh, and also to avoid them. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house or greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So be careful, you know, um, it's one thing witnessing to a Jehovah Witness, but don't invite them in for lunch and dinner and become friends because then you start to partake of their evil deeds. Then you come to 3 John. It's writing to a guy named Gaius, probably a, a believer there who has um, a home of, of, uh, of Christians. He's the one that has, uh, talks about truths, and he mentions it six times there. You see in verse 3, a couple of times, verse 4, verse 8, verse 12, also there. And obviously verse 1 too. So he talks about truth there. Probably his last writings there. And written after he wrote the book of Revelation. <clears throat> then we come to Jude. Jude is another good little book. Jude is also another brother of Jesus Christ. Also the brother of James. Um, there's controversy over that with the Catholic Church. Um, they don't believe that Jesus had brothers and sisters but the scriptures talk about him having brothers and sisters um, written to sanctify those who are sanctified by God um, you can read that in verse um, 1 Jude a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are called sanctified by God the Father preserved or, or kept in Jesus Christ um, the fact that he mentions James as his brother kind of reveals a little bit of Jude's heart. He didn't want to say I was Jesus' brother. So he said, no, I'm James' brother. I, you know, to say my, I'm Jesus' brother would be a little, you know, maybe boasting or, or something. So he's, he's humble in saying, I'm James' brother, you know. James is even better than me in a, in a sense. So he, he's writing about common faith here, and then he gives us some, some great pictures of past judgments on angels and, and Sodom and Gomorrah and, and Michael and how he wouldn't uh, bring a, a contention against the devil at all. And he tells us if we're going to rebuke the Lord, rebuke him in Jesus' name. Um, he talks about greed and false prophets. And he, he wanted us to talk about our common faith. It was kind of like, let's talk about our common faith. Oh, what Christ has done for us. And he says, no, I got to change this because there's so much happening right now in the world. And so I got to talk to you what's really happening here. The, the time is close. Um, things are happening. Uh, look at this evil world that we live in. And men creep into the churches and they begin to disrupt the church. Uh, they are unnoticed. Uh, they're liked. And they end up dividing the body of Christ. And so he talks about that. And then he gives you all those great examples in the Old Testament of division. God is not a divider. We should work so much harder to unite. Then we come to the book of Revelation. The author is John. <clears throat> oh, I love to spend time in the book of Revelation. Verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angels to his servant, John. So the, the writer is John here. It's written to the seven churches. We, we see that in chapter 2. All the way through chapter 3. Seven churches there that existed at that time. John is writing specifically to them. Now, if you back up to chapter 1, here's the outline of the whole book. And I encourage you to read this and maybe even highlight it and circle them. Because if you get this part, you'll get the whole book. You know, people are scared of the book of Revelation. I was just, I had uh, coffee with the pastor this past Tuesday. And we were talking about our, some of the studies we're doing. And um, he's in the book of Revelation right now. And he was telling me a story of a, a pastor that he just met from a pretty big church. <clears throat> and the pastor started asking him some questions about Calvary Chapel philosophy and how they go through the Bible. And then he asked him, what book are you in right now? He says, the book of Revelation. And the guy goes, oh, no, 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 I don't even go there. I don't even dare teach from that book. And he's been a minister for over 35 years. And he was like, really? Why? He goes, oh, no, that's too deep for them. They wouldn't even understand it. 
And so he, he doesn't understand the, the, the concept here. If you, gr- if you grasp this in verse 19, uh, <clears throat> well, let's go 18. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Who is that? Jesus, right? I mean, that's so clear. So I don't know how deep that is, but it's pretty clear. Okay, so then he goes, amen. And I have the keys to Haiti and of death. Write these things which you have seen. So he's telling John, I want you to write the things that you have seen, circle that. And the things which are, circle that. And the things which will take place after this. That's the context right there. And so in chapter one, you see the things that he's seen at that moment in time. And then in chapters two and three, you see the things which are, which are, so the seven churches in in chapters two and three. And then the things that will take place, four and on, chapters four to 21, the things that will be in the future. And so when we, we see things, oh, the mark of the beast, you know, is here. No, it's not here because it comes during chapter 4 and 21, so it can't be here yet. The Antichrist is here. Well, he may be here, but he's not here yet because chapter 4 has to come first. And what happens in chapter 4? The rapture. Look at, look at verse 1. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. <clears throat> Remember Thessalonians, a trumpet, the archangel, the sound of a trumpet, <clears throat> speaking to me, saying, come up here. And I will show you things which must take place after this. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one who sat upon the throne. Come up here, come up here. He's talking about the rapture there. After these things, after these things, when the rapture takes place, that is the last thing that's supposed to happen. And then these things begin. So the rapture happens right there in chapter four. And all these things begin to unfold. Chapter 4 through 22 are the things that take place. When you look at chapters 4 and 5, you see worship in heaven taking place. Everyone is worshiping the Lord. Uh, That is the time and place where God is in their presence and they are on their face worshiping Him. And then chapter 6 through 19 focus on the seven-year tribulation period. So for those seven years, the tribulation begins. The three and a half years of peace, then the next three and a half years of God's wrath being poured upon mankind. The seven-year tribulation. When we get to um, 20, let's see, yeah, 20. Through 22, we see the things that come after that, where the new heaven, chapter 21, will take place. And then in chapter 22, where he says, Behold, I come quickly, verse 12, and my reward is with me. I give to everyone according to his works. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last. Blessed are those who, who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into this city. When you read chapter 22, verse 7, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. How important is it to be reading God's word? It is very important. In fact, it should be a part of your daily life. Um, You should not be listening to it only on the radio or on Sunday or Wednesday mornings. You should be in this all the time. And so let me close with this. Just simple application. Read your word. (laughs) I mean, it's not hard. Just read your word. Pick a book. Start with chapter one and just read it. You might not understand the whole thing. That's okay. But what you understand, let the Holy Spirit minister to you. And then the second part of the application, (laughs) apply it. (laughs) Apply it. Apply it. You know, you can buy a brand new car. but If you don't stick the keys in it and hit that gas pedal, You ain't going nowhere. You have to apply it in order to enjoy it. God loves you, and he has given you a love letter right here that has passed all the trials and accusations that the world has brought against it. It's funny because the ladies this uh, morning, uh, one of the gals was on Facebook, and and someone just posted something on her page that was very um, insulting to her because they pretty much lied about the Bible, that the Bible isn't even existed. It wasn't until 
the 1600s uh, and they lied about all the books and, and all of this stuff. I'm like, wow, where did they even get all that stuff? Um, and it turns out that they're, they're, uh, they're gay and lesbian and so there's a agenda behind it. You know, I got to disprove the Bible otherwise my lifestyle is wrong. And so um, there's more, en- more enough evidence for us to, to understand. The Dead Sea Scroll is evidence. <clears throat> it's the Hebrew uh, writing of the New Testament. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, Josh McDowell finding a little doll, an Egyptian doll that's worth you know, a lot of money, but he wasn't concerned about the Egyptian doll and the, the painting on it. He wanted to know what it was made of. And so when he began to tear it apart, and this was, <clears throat> this was shortly after Christ, like I think he was dating it somewhere around the, uh, AD, the AD 80, 90 somewhere around there John may even have still been alive or shortly passed and it was in Egypt and there are lots of these dolls over there and what he found was as he began to peel the paper is that they're scriptures from the New Testament <clears throat> there the Bible was going around all over the place so much that they were just laying around everywhere they said oh let's just use the Bible for paper machete and and create these little dolls that's how um, much Bible scriptures were out there. So the evidence is overwhelming. And I saw that little doll. And I saw the scriptures myself. So I'm not lying to you. Application, read your Bible and apply it. You know, the Bible is clear that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> when we come to that realization that I am a sinner, I have offended God by my lifestyle and my choices. And I may still be offending God by my choices. When you come to that place, there's hope for us. Because that's when God begins to work in us, when we humble ourselves. And then he begins to lift us up. Don't stop there though. Say, Lord, I want to surrender myself to you. I want your will in my life. I want to know what you want me to be like. I want to be born again. I want to put on Christ I want to have the mind of Christ. I want to do the will of Christ. That should be your desire. It should be all of our desires as we live in this world.